So I hope everyone is excited. Um, we certainly are very excited and thrilled to be hosting the original Indian entrepreneur, IMA's very own Deep Kalra Jude. Um, in this age of AI, what better way to start the sessions than by probing the deep mind of Deep Kalra? I am sorry, it's a very lame pun, <laughs> but I couldn't resist it. <laughs> <laughs> Something stays equal. <laughs> so, as you all know, uh, Deep founded Make My Trip in 2000 when there was no startup ecosystem in India uh, to talk about. There were no templates to starting and scaling an internet business. And there were certainly no blueprints for the Holy Grail, which is an Indian company listing on NASDAQ. Uh, Make My Trip succeeded where several travel startups failed. And in the short 30 minutes that we have, uh, I'm going to try and uh, probe by. Uh, for the audience, uh, please don't despair. You know, we had reserved 15 minutes for a Q&A with Deep. It might need to be cut down to 10 uh, in the interest of time, uh, but you will, you will have your time with him. Uh, uh, just to give you some context, Deep, after this fireside, we're going to have uh, several founders from IMA who are building in diverse industries, uh, talk about a variety of uh, learnings you know, that they have accumulated under four broad themes. These are problems, product, people, and profits. Uh, given that you have traversed the entire journey from zero to 100 and beyond, uh, I will try and touch upon all four themes in our conversation. And this is end of the day, the IMA Entrepreneurship Summit. So we will reserve some questions on IMA for the end. So without further ado, let me dive straight into my first question. Um, you are a legend on campus. Uh, what triggered your startup journey? Why you chose travel as your industry of choice? Uh, the early struggles that you faced and uh, overcame are all part of our folklore. Uh, for our conversation today, I want to touch upon a slightly different aspect of starting up, which is your co-pilots. Uh, for anyone starting up, you know, problem identification, scoping out the market, uh, uh, you know, uh, your ability to solution are all uh, you know in the consideration set. But building is never a solo journey. Uh, so how do you know that you found the right co-pilots? Okay, right into it. Uh, before that, I just want to uh, congratulate CIA. I think it's uh, it's amazing what all you've achieved. I got a little capsule uh, last night on that beautiful terrace from Kunal and you and. Uh, Today we heard it again from Chitra and as well as from Professor Basan. It's quite amazing because I do remember those early days sir, when it was a little idea. It was a startup and uh, the company we were thinking about was Biosense. Nice to see you got a 100x return on Biosense and then Mavericks and everything. So I think it's an idea whose time has come and really uh, whatever, you, wherever you're going to take it now, uh, you've really helped a lot of companies. So it feels wonderful to see that idea, I can only imagine how all of you feel. It's like, you know, your own baby succeeding in life. So congratulations <laughs> to that. Uh, coming to your question, um, <clears throat> I was foolish enough to start alone. Maybe I'll just backtrack a bit. So I had no aspirations of being an entrepreneur right through my time at IIM Ahmedabad. None. The one entrepreneurship course that was offered, I didn't take that. Uh, I, wanted to I wanted to get a good job. Uh, my dad came from a private sector background, my mom was a teacher, so I was quite happy uh, to do that. And I joined the bank right after campus. Uh, I worked three years with Avian Amro Bank and uh, I realized while I loved the bank, it was quite a new bank in India, still kind of early days uh, for them, but I didn't, wasn't cut out for banking. And I say this because I think it's relevant for a lot of startup entrepreneurs as well as the kind of questions we got from students yesterday. Uh, secondly, then I took on an entrepreneurial job. I didn't still think entrepreneurship. I brought an American company called AMF Bowling to India. Most of my friends thought I'm mad. I'm trying to change this whole family entertainment scene. But I can't tell you A, how hard I worked and how much fun I had learning and trying to do something which was clearly too early for the market. Also building a business based on real estate in India is not trivial because the cost is so high. Learned a lot, learned hustle. Still didn't connect the dots, like Rashmi would say, and figured out I want to be an entrepreneur. But then I started panicking for reasons like my growth had stopped. Intellectual growth had kind of come to a stop, uh, you know, it was slowing down. So I joined G Capital to learn a lot. And this was 99. And there was a lot happening. Firstly, credit to G Capital, to an alumni from here, Nitin Gupta, who was my first boss there, 82. 
and then gold medalist from here and then uh, promote the scene who later I was working for when Nitin quit and hats off to them to take a pretty odd CV in but that's the power of the CV so if there are alums out here I always say use this degree, this diploma or any good degree that you have as insurance not as a noose. So if it's a noose you know oh because I'm from IIM Ahmedabad or I'm from IIT I must do this because others are doing this. No. Use it as insurance, especially up to 40 India. I mean, you'll get a job any day. You'll get a great job maybe, but you'll get a job. It's it's a very powerful degree. Uh, my my uh, colleague yesterday, one by junior, Minakshi said it. This acronym of four letters. I don't know how many alums are there. Of course, I've seen Aprameya, I've seen Amardeep, I've seen I think Amit Lakote. How many alums here? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yes, of course, Art. No, that's amazing. So, we know what this, those four letters, there's magic in those words. There are many others, I'm not putting down any other college, but we are here today. There's magic, you can open doors. We've heard many, many, many stories where people take you much more seriously or give you that chance. So, use it as insurance and that's when, that was the confidence I had when I quit GE. And I quit not because, uh, you know, I didn't try at GE. At GE, I told them. Uh, and I convinced Pramod Basin to give us $1 million to set up GEIndia.com and he picked out 15, 16 very bright people and he said we're going to do this. But it wasn't our bread and butter. We got our bread and butter from you know making money on finance, on capital and so it became a Friday or a Saturday project. And the internet was happening all around. Not many of you will remember it then. This is 99, 2000. It was starting. Yes, it was 128 kbps dial-up modem, it was painful, but for me, it was going to change everything. So I kept bringing new proposals that, gee, we need to do this. I met guys like Ajit Balakrishna at Redef and said, wow, that's amazing what he's doing. Autocar India was one of the early guys there. So the proposals came down because it was early days, but I was convinced of one thing. If internet pe kuch karna hai, you got to do it alone. So first rule of startup is, you're all in. It's a hundred percent commitment if possible like 200 mathematically not possible there's no way of just saying I'll do this on the side and I meet entrepreneurs who say listen I have a job but I'm also hedging I'm doing this or there are two of us one is full-time one is part-time I've yet to see any of those things really work out whoever's there has to be full-time now I was foolish enough to start alone so I said you know I mean if we can master this system and we can you know get through this how hard can it be? So I studied two industries, online travel, which I finally got into, or travel, and online stockbroking. And the belief was very simple. Businesses that were being done on the phone will be the first to move online. Rich media, what we see today, was just not present. Forget the phone, even on desktop, which was the only way to access the internet. There was no question of anything like, you know, shopping for, you know, garments and things like that. No question. And the more I studied it, I realized online stockbroking will do very well, but will probably belong to a big financial house eventually. And online travel for me was A, very close to my heart even then, but B, it looked like an industry ripe for disruption and said, okay, let's, let's get into it. Fortunately for me, I met three fantastic guys along the way in the early days. So employee number six, employee number maybe 10, 20, and then another guy because our earlier VP finance quit. And I think if I can take any credit, I just held on to all three of them. So I put on uh, chains. We didn't have golden chains then, but I put on shackles that they didn't leave. And those are the points that I think Madanji said very well. It's team, 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 especially the core founding team. And uh, if you find good talent, you should never, ever let them go. It's very hard for a startup, A, to find that talent, B, to get that passion. And in our downturn, so we had a horrible time from 2001 to 2005, we barely had, for the first two years, we barely had enough, I think, to take over two months of, take care of two months of salary and rent and fixed expenses. And so it was existentialism for those two years, uh, total cuts in salaries. These two guys who I made co-founders took 50 and 30% cut. I could take a 100% cut for 18 months, so that was good, had wife savings, etc. So all of those things happened and now I can't even believe, I think 30 is an age where you can do crazy things. It becomes much harder later. But I held on to these guys and in the downturn made them co-founders, gave them part of my own equity. And if the company, I mean where the company is today is I think more due to each one of them than due to me. 
One of them today is running the company, uh, Rajesh Mago. He is the group CEO. He was my CFO when he joined, moved to CEO, CEO, and then allowed me to uh, have fun like this and uh, you know uh, take off. And uh, so Rajesh is there. Kayur is uh, still a consultant. He Kayur is an Ahmedabadi actually, interestingly. And he uh, post IPO uh, wanted to, I think, no, he carried on for a few years after that. He's built a beautiful game resort in Tipeshwar and he's traveling the world, enjoying life. And uh, Sachin is uh, quit just at the IPO time and he's done a bunch of new startups. So I have one alum out here actually from Make My Trip. Where's Amit Lakotia? Yeah, so Amit knows a lot of the story. Amit joined, he's an entrepreneur now with Park Plus. And needless to say, of course, I'm an investor in this company. So for me, it's very binary. I only, I only invest in people now I've worked with. Uh, so if I've worked with them, it's either, or I know them, it's either yes or no. It's as simple as that. You've seen them. So it's very binary, the decision here. Yeah. So long answer. Thank you for that. And I'm going, going to borrow your insurance policy, but not news phrasing for the future. I think just the imagery is very compelling. Sure. Uh, but, uh, Don't leave CIA. <laughs> Um, so moving on to my next one, it is sometimes said that true entrepreneurs do not take the right decisions. They take decisions and then make them right. Uh, you know, a very nuanced difference, but one that makes a world of a difference. I wanted to ask you, Deep, can you share some pivotal moments from your journey where you were faced with some mortal crisis and uh, how you went about making your decisions right? And are there any learnings from this episode that maybe influence the collective IQ of Make My Trip? Is it possible to institutionalize these learnings? So you're long yeah. you with a long, longer question. Sorry. No, no, it's a, it's a great question, actually. I'm not sure that I entirely agree with that because one has to also make right decisions but and not be so stuck to them. So I, I have coined a phrase which I call founderitis. And I think founderitis is a disease where founders believe they know everything. And it's the exact opposite of what, again, Madanji said, and I think Chitra touched upon, or someone said about humility. And I think you've got to have the humility and the groundedness to accept that you were wrong, including in front of people. And call it pivot, call it change direction. So that's the thing about making the right decision then, or whatever, making that decision right. You know, people get too stuck in. And a lot of founders, even today I see, and clearly not earlier on, I mean, look at Madanji's story and just look at what all he went through. I had goosebumps. I've read it. I've heard it from you before, but I had goosebumps listening to it. And really, it's, it's just an incredible story. So I think when we believe that we know it all is the beginning of the end. And people start, you know, head up in the skies and thinking this is it and I can't be wrong because, you know, I'm the one who created this and this is worth X billion dollars already. It's the beginning of the end because every day we learn. And the biggest learning that we get, I think, is from two constituents. The first constituent is your customer, B2B, B2C. And the more you talk to customers, especially in growing and booming India, the customer is so different. All of you travel. Aren't you amazed at who all is traveling today on any flight, domestic or international? I'm always amazed when I take an international LCC flight. Uh, let's say you take Indigo and you go to either Phuket now Maldives, I'm not sure when we'll go, but you go to Phuket and aren't you amazed at the crowd? That is India. So why I'm saying this is, gone are the days where you could say, I know my customer. Nobody knows their customer in the retail business. Not possible because the customer is so different and there's so many segments and sub-segments. So you must talk to them. You must do a lot of consumer labs and learn from them. The second uh, constituent is uh, young employees. Young employees know more than anyone else, at least in our kind of business, because they are far more connected with customer all the time. Even if they're not talking, of course, people in customer service know pain better than anyone else. So I will get that pain escalated or I will get it through an email. I'm not taking those calls. The tonality is everything. And that's when they know pain. So if you have really brilliant customer service people and you can condense their wisdom together and get it, uh, that's, I think, very, very uh, useful. So I would just tell young entrepreneurs or any entrepreneur, don't ever get into the trap. I've been there, done that, and I've arrived. We have seen some of the biggest stories overnight collapse in, in our own lifetime. I mean, so many uh, companies, and very often the reason is because someone at the top either took the eye off the ball or started taking it a little easy 
complacency is our biggest threat. It is undoubtedly the biggest. Just like Madanji said that perseverance is the most important quality, could not agree more. That people give up too early. So I think, and I'll segue a little bit, but you know the best kept secret of the VC world? How many, how many investors out here, venture capitalists out here? Okay, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, a few. Oh, I see, yeah. Hey, how are you, Pranay? Yes. So the best kept secret of the VC world, you guys want to tell them? Okay, I'll tell you the one which I think is the best kept, which is what is the success rate of companies, uh, companies formed to companies that become successful. It is so abysmally low that no VC will ever give that number out, otherwise no one will turn entrepreneur. It's, I'm telling you, it's actually 1 to 2 percent. US, someone did a study. It's that low. Even if you're the craziest gambler in the world, when you hear that number, you say, come on, that's not happening. But why? And that is the question to ask. Why is it so low? Even today, when you have the environment, it's maybe in India right now, it could be 5 or 10 percent. It's so low because of two or three reasons. And the biggest reason is that people give up too early. They come, the first sign of winter, and they say, let's call it quits. Especially people from great institutes like this because the opportunity cost is too high. So I tell all young entrepreneurs, if you're checking in, make sure you have stamina minimum four to five years. That is how long it takes for green shoots to show. Sometimes it will happen great. It will happen in two years. Good, good luck to you. But if you don't check in with the mentality that I can sustain four to five years, I fear you might throw in the towel too early. You give up too early. And then you lament and you say, how do you know what you would have created? And I'll give you so many stories. Well, ours is definitely a case in point. We really could have shut down any day between 2001 to 2003. So what we did with these two other guys, we said, listen, uh, so when I received the good news that I'm being sarcastic, that our first early stage investor, E-Ventures is uh, packing up and they want their money back. That was within one year of investment. We had $2 million and they said, we're packing up. You can either shut down the company or you can buy us back, buy us out. I said, if I could buy you out, then why would I have taken your money in the first place? <laughs> so I learned the lesson of distress valuation then, which through friends and all you learn, oh wow, you can buy them out on the cheap. So I was sure I wanted to continue. I asked the team. We were 42 people in the company then. And that was a, that was a Friday. And it was a rare time where I said, come back on Monday. We worked all Saturdays. We worked half Sundays for the first five years. He said, just let me know if you're in or out. And secretly, I needed a lot of people to leave, but I didn't have the heart to fire them because that was the only way to survive. And uh, at almost half, we shrunk to 24. So we lost 18 people over that weekend. A lot of heavyweights went because the rule was if you're senior, cuts in salary converted into stock, hence those two co-founders. If you're junior, no cut, but we don't know when the raise will happen. Things are tough, but three of us are believing we can take this forward. So a lot of people quit, which was good news. Our fixed costs came down, we could continue. Every month, we would put our heads together. But during the month, we said, if we are in, we are in for the month, because people see people, people see founders and the look on their face. If it's positive, they believe they can. we are going in the right direction. If you have a long face, they believe that nothing's gonna happen, right? So we said, if we are in for a month, we are in. Then we would take stock every month of cash position, everything else. Left brain, definitely seeing are we moving in the right direction, the numbers. Right brain is what you call gut and uh, instinct and that would tell you, yes, something's going on. So 24 months somehow we went through. It was stubbornness and there's a fine line between stubbornness and perseverance. You, and actually in hindsight you come back and you say, ah, it was perseverance. At that time it is stubbornness. All entrepreneurs have to be a little thick skinned. All entrepreneurs have to have self-confidence. but. Let's not mistake that for lack of humility. So I think all these things go into play. And the guys who were giving, these two guys and the third guy later, were giving me so much during that time. They felt for the company with the same kind of passion. There was no way I could not make them co-founders. So when you find people, and I'm so glad I did it early, there was one more guy later on. And I wish I could have done it, but then it was too late in the day. And then it also has ramifications. Uh, other and after 10 years, he worked with us 10 years. Phenomenal guy, Mohit Gupta, and then went to Zomato, helped them go public, helped us go public for sure. And he's become a founder now on his own right. He's doing his own thing. So I think it's very rare when you get that talent, grab it, make sure, understand people's hot buttons. That is why EQ is far more important. IQ is a given. 
EQ is far more important as you go up and try to build a company, build a team. Thank you for that, Dean. Uh, so, as you know, we've worked very closely with over 1,500 startups at CIE, now IMA Ventures. And what we've come to realize is that product market fit is a very elusive concept to fathom. Many founders talk about it, but very few really understand it. The other thing we've repeatedly seen is that it is also a very impermanent state of being. Just because you found it once doesn't mean that you'll have it forever. So how do you know that this is the product that I now finally have a defensible PMF that I can scale? And to your earlier point about customers, how can you establish that this is my core customer? Is it just a, a moment of epiphany or is there a structured way to discovering your core customer? That's a great question again. I think uh, you're right. It's not a given that if you get it once, it's not one product. So Make My Trip is definitely not one product. When we launched, it was one product and that one product was flight bookings. Actually, in the initial days, it was just NRIs coming to India because India wasn't ready to buy online. And at that point of time, similar thing happened. There were at least 19 other travel startups and all of them kept pouring more money into the Indian market, expecting that more money will do something. It wasn't the era of discounting, so it was just, I mean, that, that horrible thing hadn't started. It was just about poor money and advertising and it'll happen. And we were creatures of uh, analytics and we just looked at the numbers and the numbers were showing that India, very poor conversion rate, lots of lookers, very few bookers, US, India market, NRI market, much better conversion rate, getting better because people were already comfortable on the internet. They knew if something, uh, you know, if there's a problem, uh, I can, you know, block the charge, I can reverse the charge, I can do those kind of things. There's protection there in the US, there's better business bureau, etc. All those gave a lot of confidence. In India, people were not ready to drop their credit card online. So that first product in India was flight bookings. And we were very confident. Why? Because I just looked at the ways people could book a flight in India. And the alternative was so painful and so laborious. Because or I should say so laborious and the our alternative was so was basically giving people uh, addressing the biggest concern the biggest concern we did a lot of research on this was is my travel agent giving me all the options one concern there were only three or four airlines second concern is the travel agent charging me the right price there's no MRP this changes every minute as we know there was two big concerns and so when you spoke on the phone or even you went, the suspicious people would go and sit with their travel agent, but it's a you know, green screen and it's a cryptic screen. They don't really understand what's happening. What we said was we're going to do two things. One is give all the choices. So selection, selection is key. And secondly, you will make that in, therefore you will make the informed choice. Do I want to save a thousand rupees and go call it low cost or go 5 a.m. in the morning? Or do I want to pay a thousand rupees more and get extra leg room, get a meal, get everything. But you got all the choices. You could rank it according to price. Even our first product had similar stuff. It's far more sophisticated now. And it was a Eureka moment then. Because whoever said that said, and credit card guarantee. So that was a very important one. And our tagline in the beginning for our ad was very simple. If you find a cheaper fare, we will give you twice the difference. Because we were getting the fares from the airline. And there was no way someone could give a cheaper fare because these, you know, again, discounting and all that malaise hadn't started. So there it clicked instantly and we clearly saw that the market loved it and we did a lot of consumer again testing. But now it's become far nuanced and trickier. So I'll give you our most recent successful product launch was last year. It was a product called Fairlock. And maybe some of you have used it. We think it's a really cool product because it's based on data science. Concern area, what to consumers, what was the problem? Fares are moving. How do I lock in the price? So we said, obviously, we can't take that risk on our own because if fares move down, etc. So we said, let's look at all the data. 30% of India is traveling with us today. We have tons and tons and tons of data. Process that data. And what are the chances of fares moving up or down based on trend based on? We built a pretty complex model on this. We have few people, PhDs, who only do this and they're phenomenal and we said now we'll put this out we'll give this is how we'll price it actuarial all of you have figured out that's how our insurance companies price their product we will take 250 rupees and we will guarantee you this price of 6000 rupee fare at this point of time if the fare goes up you don't pay more because you paid the premium 
But the beauty was if the fare comes down and that's there today, you get the advantage of the low fare. So it was a win-win product. It had to succeed, but it took a lot of time. And this was different reasons. The reasons were were people getting it. Was it too complex? See, everyone's not from IIM Ahmedabad and that smart. So people, how are they going to get it so easily? So we had to dumb that down. We had to put the message in different ways. We made it more attractive and guess what? For the first three months, we lost money on it. And the first reaction of business people was, let's stop offering this product. So no, we have to keep on nuancing the model. We have to finesse it a bit more. Maybe take five, 10 rupees more because you're dealing with large numbers and get it to break, break even. And in six months, we got it to break even. And today it makes a little bit of money on its own, but more importantly, it gives tons of confidence. So I think it's every product you've got to go through the same process. There is a structure. It starts with consumer labs. It goes to testing. And if anyone is on the internet business, if you have not built a platform which does A-B testing, uh, then you're missing out on the beauty of the internet. When we did MBA school and many of us joined marketing after that, test marketing was what? Go to favorite city was what? I think uh, go to Vizac, go to Chandigarh, go to, what was it? Few little cities where you get to test the product. And we would test and test and test. Levers would test and test. PNG would test and test. And then we'd assume it'll work for the rest of the market. Thankfully, in the internet world, it's much easier. Uh, AB platform means you can test a new release on a control group A with 1%, half percent, five percent traffic, keeping control or keeping control group B constant with 99%, Cetrus Paribus. Everything else remaining constant. It is the most powerful thing. It's very hard to build that platform, but any internet company worth their name today has that platform. So when you talk to your young B2C companies, please encourage them to build that. You can test anything. So today when I go to a young product manager and I say, ye laga do, ye change kar do, he has every right to tell me to bugger off and I'm not going to do that. And then I'll beg him and say, Achha, yaar, aise karo. 0 0.01% traffic, pe ye test karo meri hypothesis. So, okay. so we by and large for flights, we have 0.1% for testing at any point of time. We're testing new things. For hotels, it's 1%. We're testing all the time new things. And then after, again, you got to test it long enough. Because initially, when people see change, they panic. This is a fake site, this is spam. That's customer behavior. So you've got to test it long enough to realize that people really liked it. And then if they have, then you make the change. Then you dial it up. You move from that 0.1% to 1% to 5 You never bet the bank straight away. So it's a very structured way and the right way of doing it. Thank you, Deep. We've spoken about people quite a bit today, both uh, in Mr. Mohanka's talk. Also, you mentioned your co-pilots. So I want to shift gears and now maybe talk about founder leadership for a moment. Um, every founder in this room would want to be a Deep Kalra, who not only founded a large company, uh, but also uh, scaled it to an IPO and beyond. Uh, however, you know, this breed of successful founder come CEOs is very, very rare, according to a study by HBS. Only about 40% of the founders are still CEOs at the end of four years, and maybe less than a quarter lead it to an IPO. So how did you scale yourself as a leader as your company grew? Clearly that data doesn't apply to IMA. 42 years going strong as an entrepreneur CEO. Okay, now exec, non-executive chairman for a bit. But I think that's a US stat. I think in India it's different. Uh, it would be longer. But still it's not long enough. In, in US you're right. I had read that number and I was like, wow, that's it. So it almost felt like you'll go IPO and then after four years you have this thing. I think we as... Indians, uh, society as a people are far more emotional, are far more committed uh, and are far more passionate about the company that they've created and are willing to go to any length, I think, to see that succeed. You heard that one story. I think ours is no different. You're going to hear from Aprameya later. You'll hear from many people how, you know, they will go to any extent. Uh, so also hunkering down here is much easier. So the US and other markets is really hard because it's so expensive, the cost of living. Here you can cut back very easily. Going 18 months without salary now was fairly easy. Why? We lived in a uh, house, first floor house in Delhi, which was 12,000 12, rupees per month rent. It was doable. One could do it with savings. You can't do that in a big city in the US. Today you can't probably do it in Bombay or Delhi also, but maybe that time was different. Secondly, you can cut back on many things. You can really, people go and stay with their parents. Sanjeev famously says all the time, he started knocking at the garage. I think that was his parents' garage or whatever. So 
I think you can do these crazy things, which is very hard to do in markets, which is this thing. And that's the beauty of India. Also, I really feel that as a race, we are just far more resilient. Uh, pride is very important too. The fact that failure is a bad word in India, we say, uh, maybe also works to a positive out here. So where people say never give up and never give in. So I think all these things, Priyanka, play a role for people to actually challenge that maxim out here and go ahead. I took it naturally one step at a time, but I was also very acutely aware that at some point of time, uh, uh, you know, someone and that was probably Rajesh would do a better job and I would do a better job as so for the last few years, I was executive chairman full time and he was CEO. It was also logical growth for him. Uh, I also realized my own shortcomings. Uh, my attention span has got shorter and shorter. Uh, I would probably, if I tested, I'd have ADD. I get bored very easily, I'm telling you. So I was realizing that I have these things I'm not able to go through. Like first five years after IPO, and like, you know, we listed on NASDAQ, every quarter we were on the road for one to two weeks, meeting investors from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., going to a new city every day, the most exhausting part of thing. I did it for five years, for 20 quarters, and then I just said, listen, I'm gonna cut back on this. I'm gonna do this less and less. COVID was a big blessing, horrible for our business. It killed our business. But big blessing, it taught everyone, you don't need to travel. So now we do all our investors' uh, road shows a week on, uh, you know, sitting in our home uh, home base. And we only go for investor conferences where over one to two days you can speed date and meet, you know, 20, 30, 40 investors. So I think uh, you have to realize what your motivations are. But my motivation to be involved with new features, new products, design, people, that didn't come down. So that was still exciting. So I continued doing that. And then finally, a year ago, a year and a quarter ago, I uh, actually wanted to spend more time on uh, uh, non-monetary uh, non pursuits. So I have now ch chosen to be non-executive and convince the board, convince Rajesh. So I'm around. If I'm in town, I go in twice a week. But I spend a lot of time with young entrepreneurs, with some NGOs, causes. So just uh, having fun, a lot of travel. So I invite you to come and have fun with us. Yeah, anytime <laughs> you know I'll be here. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into the IMA round. And this is a rapid fire round. Uh, most of the students and alumni here could possibly relate. I do. Please. <laughs> uh, so favorite professor? Oh, I met him yesterday, Professor A.K. Jain. Dreaded him then, was so fearful of them. I love him today. Love him today. Your least favorite course? Least favorite course uh, could have been uh, at SMDA statistical data <laughs> at that point of time. But God bless him, great professor. When did you miss the 11.59.59 deadline? I've been told that's a thing at IMA. I think I did a couple of times. And I had the same excuse or the same reason as you had when you made those funny comments in the morning, most of the time. So. <laughs> what was your dorm name? Uh, short enough not to get bastardized, so luckily Deep stayed Deep. But later on somewhere, we had another guy in the batch who was DK, though he was uh, Deepak Sharma, but he became DK. I think when he was DK, right? So luckily I didn't get that, but now a lot of guys call me DK. Sure. So oh, we had another one, sorry. Anyone who came from St. Stephen's in our time got ragged on campus a lot. So I don't know if there are any Stephanians out here, but we got ragged because uh, whatever. we were. So we all called Sud. So <laughs> does it. So. <laughs> Um, one unique learning from IMA that helped your entrepreneurial journey? I think the confidence really. Uh, so one, it's the greatest leveler. You get into IMA, it's a great feeling because wow, you cleared, you got into the hallowed portals. You come here and you realize just how not bright you are. And you see, I, I, was no, I, I was nowhere close to the brightest guys in the batch. And you see the ice calls and you just see, it was unbelievable how smart they were. And some of them, actually half of them didn't work that hard. Or I don't know when they were. They were just so cool and calm and they played every sport and they had all the fun. And they went and aced the exams. So it was just unbelievable. Got rems from them. I had two ice calls, both very dear friends of mine in my dorm. And they literally helped me pass, I think, a lot of exams. But uh, yeah, so I think that a great leveler. You stay grounded, you never forget how smart smart is. And second, the confidence then to take on. If you can go through this, I think the first year is pretty tough. You go through the first year, second year you learn how to ace the system. You also get comfortable wherever you are. Then you can take on anything. So that gave me a lot of confidence when I started make my trip. 
that saying how hard can it be, we've learned structure, we can break down complex problems into simple ones, we'll take it one step at a time. So my final one uh, for Deep is what is your vision for IMA's entrepreneurial community that consists of students, faculty, founders, investors and also us? I, I guess to become a mini ecosystem, to become a platform really. And you know, I think CIS said that very well and we had some chat yesterday. I would love to see that happening. I'd love to see more and more entrepreneurs coming out of here. It's a bit of a, a contradiction because it's no secret that Folks who pass out of here get the best jobs, or at least the best paying jobs, which need not be the best job. So opportunity cost is very high. But what has changed over the last 10 years in the country is that I think entrepreneurship is now considered, uh, you know, a very good, respected place to try. It's not like something you did either because you didn't get a job or because it was cool and sexy. It's neither. It's grunt work. It's hard. And the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is not the stress of day to day making sure the money. I mean, for me, I can tell you what kept me up at night uh, at that point of time was not that we might fail and I'll have to find something else. But the 23 other guys at that time and then later 100 guys who believed in me, reposed their trust in me and thought that I knew where I'm going and therefore I couldn't fail for their sake. That's the real stress of an entrepreneur that you're carrying the weight. Uh, you know, that's your cross to bear and you're really carrying everyone's weight. I think that is the real stress. So it's not easy by any stretch. So get into it only if you're ready for that part. Thank you, Deep.